so we can be, do better or easier our treatments. You know, regularly or, or historically, we've used uh, um, arches, we've used extra devices to do some certain movements. But and nowadays, we can help us with the use of this mini screws, and it, it helps us to do the treatment better. Now, at the beginning, when we're starting to work with TADS, uh, the first or the, the primary um, fear that we have is to, you know, to, to damage the roots of our patients or the, the dental roots. So the first thing that we should do is to understand a little bit of the anatomical sites of insertion that we can use. And once you start understanding them or using them, it's going to be much more easier for you to, to uh, use them. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, we're going to see what stats, the definition, how we can use them, and some basic principles of, the, of, uh, of working with temporary anchors devices. Now, TADS, uh, there are different ways that we can call them. You know, a mini implant, it's, it's called that's the diameter. It's not greater than 1.9. Uh, another uh, thing that we can use is the micro implant diameter is less than 1.5. That's when we call it micro implant. And mini screw, you can use them to refer to both of them. Okay, so you can use, say TADS, mini screws, um, it, 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 you know, depends where you are or where you studied or, or how you used to talk, you know, to, to say them, but they, they're all basically the same thing that we can do. Okay, now the TAD is, a, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it means temporary anchorage device. Okay, now we know that anchorage in orthodontics is referring to the resistance of the use of uh, the reaction of an applied force. You know, we, we, and always we use uh, different types of anchorage when we're doing our orthodontic treatment. Now, uh, one term of it is, is, is about the absolute anchorage. Now, this is what we refer to as, as absolute or total anchorage when it remains completely stationary. Now, uh, with uh, normal appliances, we never had uh, a certainty of having an absolute or maximum anchorage, but now with uh, you know, with a maxil with a skeletal anchorage, we we can be uh, sure that we're doing it. Okay. Now, uh, talking about clinical applications, we have the direct anchorage and indirect anchorage. Okay. When we're talking about direct anchorage, is when we put the force directly to the mini screw or the mini mini implant directly to the notch, uh, to a hook or to a bracket. Okay, like we see here in the picture. Now that's the direct anchorage uh, situation. We can also use it like this. In this case, we're intruding the anterior uh, segment of, of a patient. Now, this is uh, when we do it directly. Now, but in some cases, we're gonna use an indirect anchorage, like in this case, that we're using the mini screw with some uh, ligature, metal ligature, so we can have uh, an anchorage on the hook side, so the uh, open coil does the force in, in, in to distalize the molars. Now, it's, it's very important to understand where we're going to pass the forces so it's going to be easier because sometimes if we always try to use the direct anchorage, sometimes we're going to have some negative effects in the movement of the teeth. Now, uh, we can also use a situation like this one that I'm going to show you where you have an have impacted canine and we use the, the mini screw like we see here. It's an infrasigmatic uh, mini screw. We use it as an indirect anchorage for a lever arm so we can pull or we can track we can, uh, the canine, we can traction it not only downwards but out, outwards. One of the problems that we had or that I had as a clinician a long time ago was that when we did, when we did a radiographic uh, um, diagnosis, we didn't actually see exactly the position of our impacted canines. Now, nowadays we can use the CBCT and we can see exactly where the canine is. And you know, this is a great form. So we can just pull them out of the roots of the lateral incisors so we can um, bring out that teeth. Okay. Now I'm and late and most a little bit um, further on in this in this lecture, I'm going to show you a couple of cases that we did this with impacted canine. So we put so in this case we we use this mini and this mini implant or mini screw for indirect anchorage with a lever arm so we can traction out the canine, okay? That that's a very common situation that we have in our practices. Okay, and this is, you know, the beginning and the end for those canines that 
you know, a lot of times we're gonna, we're, they give us a lot of uh, problems. Okay, well now we, we understand that Anchorage and orthodontics is, is the definition is the resistance to an unwanted tooth movement, okay? And this, we can use it with, uh, we, we can anchor, we can use Anchorage with other, with several teeth, like a group. Uh, we can use it from a pet, from the, from um, some appliances like a TPA or a extraoral device. And uh, less frequently, we use it anchors screws to the jaws, okay? Now we have a di difference between what's mini screws and mini plates. This information, I got it from this book that I'm gonna, I recommend you this book from Dr. John Lean. It's, it's called Creative Orthodontics with the Damon System and the TAD uh, for difficult malocclusions. And, and one of the tables in this book was talking about the difference between a mini screw and a mini plate. Now the, the great difference, it's, you know, the, the, it's more economic to use a mini screw. It's more expensive to use a mini plate. Uh, the screws sometimes we use only one. It's a simple uh, procedure that's it's mostly done by the orthodontist. Now, a uh, mini plate, it's a little bit more difficult to do it. You need some anesthesia and regularly it's, it's mostly done by our periodontist or the surgeon. Now, um, for, uh, you know, to, to remove it, you need to do another surgery. Now, that's, that's uh, a situation for our patients that they had to go, they have to go to, uh, to with two uh, procedures. But a uh, mini implant's more easier. Now, I, I really recommend for all the students and all the doctors to, for them to put the mini implants because it's more easier. And once you start doing it, it, it every time it's, it's easier. At the beginning, I'm going to be very honest with you. You're going, we're going to have some mistakes. They're going to fail. That's very, that's, that's, um, that's very important to start. That, that's a learning curve. And once you start using them more regularly, it's going to be better for our practice. We're going to, it's going to be more useful. Now, this is an example of a mini plate. This, this are screwed or anchored to the maxilla or the mandible. And sometimes we use them as a, for uh, orthopedic reasons to do, uh, like in this case, we use the face mask so we can do a, a maxillary protrusion, okay? And the mini implant, well, it's more easier and it's more direct anchorage so we can move a teeth or a segment of teeth, like in this case, okay? Now, um, it doesn't, it, you can use any kind of, of brackets, you can use any kind of appliances. It's, it's the, the important thing here is to understand a little bit about the biomechanics of, of the movement, okay? Now, uh, a very, uh, you know, it's very common for us when we have some cases that we're going to do some, uh, you know, like in the extraction cases, if we don't control the anterior position of our incisors, in the moment that we start retracting, we're going to get an, we're going to get an excessive overjet uh, overbite. And if we don't control, we don't do a control uh, space closure, we're going to have this negative effect. Now, uh, this kind of mini implants, so it, it helps us a lot for the intrusion, you know, to correct the overbite when we're doing a splash closure, but it also helps us in cases where we have a, some gummy smile, we can intrude a little bit the anterior incisors, and that's going to be a more aesthetic result at the end of the treatment. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to start, start talking about some uh, information. Okay, like, well, like in this case, this we had an, uh, you can see on the left side, it was a treatment, this patient have our, it was in uh, a treatment from another office. So when she came to the office, she had a great overbite. So we, what we did in this case, we put the mini implant so we can intrude the interior segment. And once we got the correct overbite, we started closing the, the spaces. Now you can see, the difference or, or the, the, the way that we corrected the position of the, of, of the inclination of the incisors prior to the closure of the space, okay? So this is how, helps us very much to do some simple mechanics. You can also do it with some utility arches, but this is, uh, I, I, for me, it's more easier to put an implant than to bend wire. Okay. So this is the correct, you know, what we changed the inclination of the, of the teeth prior to the space closure. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some properties about the, the, the temporary anchor devices. And we, first of all, as every, everything that we use in the mouth of our patients, it, it has to have biocompatibility, bio okay? 
This means that the materials that we're using it doesn't produce any, any reaction, allergic or toxic reaction with our patients. Now, this is very important because we are gonna insert the, the mini screws in bone and in soft tissue. So we need to have, uh, it needs to, we need to have this property of biocompatibility. Now, the, the, the majority of the mini implants that we use are made of stainless steel. Now, this is very important so we don't have no osteointubation and it's a more resistant material. And also it's gonna be easier to remove because we don't have no osteointegration in, this, in the cases, okay? Now, this is an example of a placement of the mini implant. Now, we need to understand, all, all, we need to understand where, where, where we're gonna put it because if, we, we, if our insertion site is not the correct one, we're gonna have a tissue soreness, we're gonna have tearing of the tissue, and it's going to be factors that are going to that are going to be that are going to it's going to be more probable to have a failure. Okay, so we need to to understand what we're going to do there. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, TAD. Now TAD, the TADs are are um, they have three principal parts of them. Now the first one is going to be the head. It this can have a, like a, a button shape and have a little mushroom shape. Sometimes they have like a bracket shape also, or an, an hole, like we can see here, like a little slot. Then we're gonna have the transmucal profile. Now this is very important because this, is, this has to be, we have to have a good transmucal profile so we don't have so much, a lot of inflammation in, in our patient. Now uh, we need to, there are some mini implants or mini screws that have a, a shorter uh, transmucal profile and some have a long, larger one like this one. Now this is gonna be, uh, this kind of implant that are larger, are, we're gonna use them for like in the, in, the, in the mandible ramus, in the buccal shelf, or in the infrared sigmatic crest. And we're gonna have the endiosis part that this regularly, it, it measures about six millimeters. Now, uh, the, these are the most common sites for uh, the insertion of the mini screws. We have first the, the infrasigmatic uh, shell, uh, crest. Now, this is the information that we have from Dr. John Ling's book. And he regularly uses for this side two by eight millimeters in uh, size of the mini screw. I use two by eight, two by 10, even two by 14, depends on the patient. But it's a very simple doing, it's, all, it's always self drilling. And we use them for the retraction of the anterior teeth, a whole arch uh, distillation are inclus inclusive to do more, some more intrusion. Now the buccal shelf ones, these are two by 12 millimeters in, in, in size. And we also use them for retraction of the anterior, anterior teeth in the, in the mandibular arch and also more intrusion. Now in the mid uh, palatal region, uh, like for intrusion, if we are using them in the, in the palatal, it's, uh, I recommend the use of two by eight millimeters. And, and I, I don't know if you uh, saw uh, the last um, uh, seminar or webinar that we did, we, were, we used, uh, we, I showed you a patient that we put um, an appliance to intrude in the, in the palate. We use a two by eight millimeter size uh, mini implant. And because um, we, we, we put them uh, by the premolar region and it's close to the midline, that's where we have the best cortical bone so we can put, insert the mini implants. Now, if we're using them if for interdental spaces between roots, uh, I recommend the use of 1.5 as a diameter. There, there are a lot of implants that are 1.4 or 1.3 in diameter. Those are the ideal sizes so we can use them between the roots, okay? It's very easy to put them. We, we just need to understand the, the, the insertion sites. And, also for, for palatal size of the molars, we can use two by 12. It depends also on the tissue, how, how thick we have the tissue in, those, in that region. And sometimes we're gonna put them also in indentual areas. The, the, the indication here, will, if we don't have uh, any roots there, the, the ideal size is two millimeters of, of diameter. Okay, now when we put mini implants, we have a lot of complications. I'm gonna show you here, uh, this is a video of a, of a student of mine that one day came to me and told me that she just put uh, an implant at some, um, the prior appointment, and you can see the movement it had. Oh, obviously, we have a failure here. 
Now, it's very important for all the students to understand that you're going to have failures in your treatments. And um, like the 10% of the implants that we, that we put on the, a patient's mouth are going to fail. Now, this, uh, this percentage, it, it may be due because of the fact that we, don't, we didn't ask to integrate the implants because they're stainless steel. And, that, uh, and we don't do, um, uh, we use stainless steel because we don't want them to us to integrate so we can, re re we can remove them easily. Okay, now the most, the most common reasons for failure are, number one, that we put them in an appropriate site. Uh, two, if, if you use a drill, you know, to do a like a, a prior insertion that heats up the, the bone and that's a factor for failure of the mini implant. Also, if we don't have a, a, a good primal uh, stability and, and bad hygiene, we're going we're gonna to have a high incidence of, the, of failure. Also, if the, if the patient at the moment that they bite, if, if they have some trauma there, that, that mini implant is going to failure. And also, sometimes we have inflammation around the implant. That's the reason that, that they, those are the most common reasons of failure of the mini implant. We also have like this example. This was also a, a picture of a student of mine that he sent it. He, they just removed brackets and you can see those mini implants in the infra, infrasigmatic uh, crest. And you can see them uh, they, that they, they were not put in, in, uh, in, in, in a good site. So they had a lot of movement there. You can see them, they, they were just you know, like covered by the tissue. And obviously, well, this is a failure because you have to, uh, for the removal, you need to put anesthesia, you need to uh, open a little flap there so you can remove the mini implants. Now, it's very important that, that that's, we need to understand the, ins the insertion site so we don't have the situations with our patients, okay? Now, uh, it's common, you know, that this happens. So this is, we, 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 sh we, we must not alarm ourselves a lot, but we need to understand we need, well, that, that we need to, um, you know, try to avoid the situations, okay? Now, the recommendations is to carefully plan the case. So you can, you can choose the best implant, the best size of implant, and you can also choose the best insertion site. Now, the, uh, we, we must remember that the eye sees what the mind knows. So uh, sometimes when we don't know what we're going to do, it's, it's more easier, easy for us to, to overpass certain details. But we, when we understand correctly what we're going to do, it's going to be more easy for us to see when, when uh, different situations that we need to work with. Okay. Now, it, this, I, I recommend you this article. It's talking about the zones of opportunity. And th this is like for the implant site selection. Okay. Now, uh, well, the, the, the insertion sites, usually we, we use what it's attached or keratinized gingiva, you know, inserted gingiva. If we use a mobile or not keratinized gingiva, what's going to happen? We're going to have a poor tissue adaptation. We have, we're going to have irritation. We can have tearing of the tissue also. We're going to have a neoplasia or overgrowing of the tissue, and that's, that's going to cover the mini implant. And also, we're going to start having some micro jiggling there, some little movement. So it's very important for us to put this mini implants in attached gingiva. Okay. Now, the, the ideal insertion sites, if we're going to put them on the buccal part or in, in of our upper or lower uh, jaw, we need to... Uh, we need to see exactly where we have the, the, the muckle gingival junction, okay? Now, just like here, we, we can see it, the area between the green line, that's the muckle gingival uh, junction, and the blue line, that's where the mobile, uh, uh, where the mobile tissue starts, that's going to be the ideal zone so we can put the mini implant. If we put the mini implant lower from there or more uh, um, occlusal or towards the teeth, the problem is that we're gonna we're not gonna have a correct bone uh, thickness there or cortical bone, and if we put them a little bit more lower, you know, like to be a little bit more safe, that implant's gonna fail. That was the the problem that I had at the beginning when when I started using the mini implants. So the ideal zone is where you can see there where there's a yellow line that's just a little bit above of the muckle gingival uh, junction, and and a little bit lower from 
we, where we have the mobile uh, tissue. Now, if we put it in, in the zone, like we can see here in this picture where we have a low mobility area, we're not gonna have uh, inflammation, but it, like in the, in the lower picture, that this is from the article, if we put it um, you know, more, more apically or, or, or um, yes, more, more on the mobile uh, area, mobile tissue area, we're gonna have a lot of inflammation there. And it's gonna be very painful for our patient. Now, the more we go, uh, to the to the apex of the teeth, we're going to have a more wider space for the insertion. You know that uh, if we were going more uh, gingival or more to the clusal plane, we're going to have a more um, conversion of the roots. So we're going to try to, to put them a little bit more apically, so we don't have uh, we're, so we don't touch the roots of the of the teeth. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a case. We're going to start with the cases. And this is a typical, we, this is a very young patient, around 13 years old. She's a very uh, skinny per patient. She has big teeth. So when she smiles, she has a lot of protrusion. Now in this case, uh, normally we don't, uh, I don't like to indicate extractions, but we have, we, we must do a correct analysis of the face of the patient and of the bite. And sometimes like in the, the case of this patient, where we have larger teeth and protruded teeth, what well, we're gonna do extraction of the of the bicuspids, you know. You can see her smile. She didn't she didn't close very good her lips. So uh, it was a uh, you know it was like a, a, a borderline a class two molar, but uh, because of the size of the teeth and facial features, we we indicated in this case extraction of the, of the upper first bicuspids. Okay. Now this is in the treatment. We were retracting, we're going to start the retraction. You can see that we have a, a more improved profile. Now, in this case, is when we have, uh, when we're going to close spaces of our patients, we need to control the torque or the position of the incisors. That, that was, that was, what, 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 that's what I mentioned to you at the beginning of the lecture, that a lot of the times that we, if we don't control the torque of our, of our brackets or our case, we're going to have an, 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 we're going to do an overcorrection of the overbite. You know, we're going to increase the overbite and we're going to have difficulties at the closure of the space. So in this case, I decided to put some uh, mini, mini screws between the six upper first molar and the upper second uh, bicuspid. Okay. We were closing the spaces. We were using some uh, class two elastics to help us with the closure. Uh, we're using some MBT brackets that's why you can see that we have the laterals inverted so we have a little spaces there but as we're going to close the space i didn't want my incisors to to red to client so we put this mini implants to help us with this place closure so we put them between the the first molar and the second bicuspid now we're using here some power hooks this power hooks have three levels you know three sizes you can cut them so they can adapt exactly to, to your situation or what you want to do with your patient. This kind of, of power hooks, they're crimpable. You put them directly to the arch and it's very easy to insert them. You can see here that we still have a little bit of overjet in this case. And we have some protrusion, but I didn't want this uh, incisal position to, to get overcorrected. That's why we put the, the mini implants. Now you can see them, you can see them on the lateral picture. And in this case, so to understand a little bit what we're, what we're trying to do here, if you can imagine, you know, like the roots of the teeth of the molar and the incisors, we're going to have the center of, of uh, resistance, okay? That's basically between the, uh, in the middle of the root. And what we're going to do here, we're going to put this power hook. You can see this on the picture that it has three levels. You can cut them, you know, you polish them, you cut them, and you put, it's, crimp, it's a crimpable hook. You put them on the arch wire. Now we're going to put a power chain uh, at the level of the center of resistance. Now we try to do this to avoid that negative effect of the torque. You know, to 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 avoid to have that uh, overcorrection of the overbite. That's why we put the mini implant in this zone when we're closing spaces. Spaces. So this we, it helps us to avoid that. Now. Of course, you need to put some curve of speed on, on your arch wire. You can also use some a third order bends in the anterior. It, it depends on how you like to close spaces. If you use a, a loop, 
a retraction arch with a loop there, well, obviously you put the, the third order band on the anterior, so you can avoid that um, negative effect. Now, I, try, I, I always like to do it the most easiest way for me. So uh, this is a very easy way. You put the mini implants and it helps. But also in, in a lot of cases, we're gonna have some soreness of the tissue. I'm gonna show you uh, this patient had a lot of inflammation as we close the space. This is the day we insert them. So you can see that they're in, and we, we're gonna use them and attach gingiva. So we don't have a lot of uh, negative effects there. Now, this is just a little video so you can see how we put them on. It's very easy. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back a little bit. It's a little video, so it's very easy to put them. I, I, I always like to put some anesthesia. There's a lot of uh, authors, a lot of lectures that they say that you can only use, you could do, use an, uh, topic anesthesia. Personally, I, I don't want our patient, my patients to have uh, any pain. So I, I always um, put some anesthesia. Now this mini implants are 1.5 diameter by eight millimeters long. So it's very easy to put them in the mouth. And we're, we, it's, it's a very simple procedure. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next picture. And this is some months later, we were, we, we stopped using the mini implants for the, for the retraction. We we're only finishing to close the space. Now we have a, a good overbite, a good overjet. And this was, now we're gonna just finish the details of this patient. And I'm gonna show you just a little bit of the inflammation, but we can see the profile. The most important thing when we're working with extraction cases is that we want to maintain the, the inclination of the incisors in a correct position. Uh, a lot of the times what happens, we have a lot of return inclination. We can fix that at the end. You know, we'll put some third order bands and you can do, do that, but we're gonna waste some time. So it's, it's, if, we, if we can avoid that, it's gonna be easier. Now, this is pictures that they would put, we took out the, the, the mini implants. Now you can see it's very, that tissue, is, it has a lot of inflammation. This also happens if our patients, uh, they don't uh, have a good hygiene, hygiene. Well, this can happen. And in this case, we had to remove them and we had to take, I, I also took the premolar brackets off. So that soreness uh, or the inflammation uh, diminishes. Okay, see the inflammation in this case. So, but we can see that the spaces are, are closing. We have a, a better space closure there. And we, what, we, what, what we want to do is, you know, to maintain the position of the incisor. You can see at the beginning picture, they were very procaline. So as we were closing the space, her profile was much, much better. Now, if you can imagine this patient, she's, she was uh, very petite, you know, very, very short size and, and very thin face. And she had a very beautiful smile, but her teeth were big. So they, were, they looked very protruding. Now he, here we have the sequence, how we were uh, with the overjet, how we, we had the very, a lot of protrusion at the beginning. So we were closing the spaces. We did some, in, in some of the pictures, you can see that we did some uh, bracket rebonding or replace, uh, we rebonded a lot of bracket position. So this is at the, 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 the progression of the treatment. We're trying to maintain the angulation of the incisors so that we don't have a, an, an excess overbite. Now that's at the end of the treatment. You can see she has a very a good smile. Her profile also looks better. She likes very much her smile. And you can see that this is a very common treatment, you know, a very uh, common situation that we have in our offices. We have a speed closure, but the, the important thing here is that we have a correct overjet and an overbite. Okay. That's the end of the treatment and the progression from the beginning to the end. Now it's very important for us to, to try to maintain our incisor position so we don't have that negative effect. Okay, this is the profile. I'm gonna go a little bit faster here so I can cover all the material that we have. Now, well, uh, this is, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit over this. This I saw this picture on internet. I don't have the rights of it, but 
And you can see here, it's very interesting because we can see a lot, you know, as orthos, we also, we always try to imagine a different uh, biomechanics or the different approaches that we can do with our patients. Now, in this case, when I first saw the picture, I was like uh, a little bit strange, but I, I, I tried to understand and to put myself in the situation of the doctor. Now you can see here, if we do some lateral uh, images of this patient, that it had the four upper bicuspid extraction. Okay, it, it has a, a lower first bicuspid and on the upper it had, the, the, it was missing, it was missing the, all the bicuspids. So they were using this mini implants and using this round wire with some brackets that were placed on the, on the gingival section of the incisors. So, so that force goes more to the center of rotation and the lower, I can, you can see the brackets that are placed very incisively. So you can, you, when we see this, we, we can see that a lot of things that we could have done different. But we, when, we, when we see what the doctor was doing, he was using a lot of imagination and a whole lot of biomechanics. So that's what we should do. Now, we, we should understand that we, when we're using um, mini implants, when we're retracting, we must understand where the central rotation of the maxillary arch and the, and the mandible are. Now, in, when we're doing a whole arch retraction, um, the, the center of resistance of the, of the maxillary arch is going to be at around this, uh, about uh, uh, in between the roots of the premolars, of the bicuspids, and in the, laurel arch, in the lower arch also. Now, a typical uh, situation that we have in, our, in, in the cases, when we have um, a, a bicuspid extractions, when we start the retraction, we're going to have this situation on the front, on the, on the, up, on the front on our, in our incisors. So when we have an, uh, an overcorrection of the overbite, we're going to have, and we continue to close the spaces, we're going to start opening the bites on, on the lateral side, on the buccal side. So it's very important to control the torque when we're closing spaces. So in this case, is when, when we're doing a retraction, we need to change the direction of the force upper or more to the central resistance of the maxillary and, and the mandibular arch so we can close a better space. Obviously here in the, in the, in this figures, it looks very easy, but we must see this in a clinical application. Now, um, I'm gonna share with you this slides and, and this helps us, this is, uh, this article is, it's very good one. We, we can see here in the green zones where we have um, the, the most desirable width between the roots so we can put our mini implants. Now you can see between the, the upper inside, central incisors, because of the roots, because they are uh, more divergent, uh, we have great space there. But the problem is if the, the, the insertion of the frenum, of the, of the, of the frenillo, that we call it, now, the insertion of the, uh, the lip there, we, we, if we put a mini implant in that zone, we're gonna have a lot of irritation. So uh, we can see here the ideal width or the zones where we're gonna put the mini implant. And also in this figure, we can see the ideal, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 desired, uh, the desired thickness of bone where we're gonna have them, okay? So these guidelines are very uh, easy. So we can see how it's gonna be difficult to put the mini implants when we're putting them between the roots. So that's why nowadays we're trying to use extra alveolar uh, sites like uh, buccal shelf, the palate, or um, in the infrasigmatic shelf, cresp, sorry. Okay, we're gonna see another case here uh, where we put in a, a mini implant between the roots. Now it's very interesting. I, I put, I'm going to put this uh, slide so we can understand that we're going to have certain curvature there. We're going to, it's going to be uh, when we're inserting the mini implant, we're going to have a curved arch. So we need to put to ideally position that screw. This screw we we put it in a practice that we had in a, in a seminar in a course. So we inserted it and we removed it. I'm going to show you here with this video. On this one, I'm gonna, let me, we're, we, we're, as you see in the left uh, video, what we're doing, we're marking the tissue with our, our, with, with our instrument so we can imagine where we have the roots. Now, just in, in where we have the, the mucal gingival 
juncture. That's where we, we market. Probably prior to that, we, we put some anesthesia. So we're going to mark the tissue so we can insert better the, the mini implant. Now on the left, on the right uh, video, we already marked the tissue. It was already it had the anesthesia. So um, as I showed you in the past lecture, I, I like to use a very big uh, mirror when we're putting the mini implant so we can visualize where the roots are so we can do the uh, correct insertion there. Oh, sorry. I just... Let me just advance this one. Okay. So you can see how we're inserting the mini implant there between the roots. And I have my assistant helping me with this mirror so I can see exactly how we're gonna position that between the roots. It's gonna, it's gonna be very easy to do that. As I told you, uh, this the day that we put this implant, it was a, a patient, it was a doctor that, would have, that was in one of the courses that we do. That's why he didn't have some brackets. He was a volunteer there. Okay, let me go a little bit so we can cover the, now it's very important, you know, as you see where, where we're gonna put exactly between the, that, that's the transmucal profile. And that, that's, gonna, that's, is, that's what's gonna be in contact with the gingival tissue. So it's very important for that to be a very soft part of the implant. And we're gonna put it at the mucal gingival junction, okay? Just a little bit upper from them. Okay, we're gonna see another case. This was a patient, she, she had a prior, uh, another uh, ortho treatment. And she had a very, uh, you know, um, straight profile. Personally, when I saw the case, I told her that that I that I thought she didn't need to use. Uh, she, she did, she, in my opinion, she she wasn't an extraction case, but the extractions were done because she thought her profile was a little bit protruded. Now you can see on the picture that she had some mini implants that the, the that the doctor placed them. Uh, and the other treatment, but he never used them. She, he just put them there and he started to, he puts brackets and started closing spaces. And you can see how we have an overbite there. So this situation is very common that in the lower arch, you close faster the spaces. And then in the upper, you start having an uh, uh, increase in overbite. So you have a excessive overbite there and you have a lot of spaces in that treatment. So uh, this patient, she came to me and she told me I, that she was stuck with the treatment, so she wanted to uh, close the spaces. So we took out the brackets, we started using some um, uh, the space closure. So as, as the treatment advanced and I, and I was taking pictures for, our, um, you know, we, we take the progress or the advanced pictures, I started to notice that she smiled, she had a lot of, she had, she had a gummy smile. At the beginning, she, did, she didn't have that smile because, you know, when, when the patients first come to our office, sometimes they don't do a, you know, a very, they only do like a very post smile, not a social smile. And I started seeing that she had some gingival uh, gummy smile. So we placed some brackets, we placed some uh, mini screws here. We have another video here between the, the canine and the lateral incisor. So we can start intruding the anterior part. Now, as you can see, the first thing that I always do, I use the, the periodontal probe to, to put them, you know, to visualize the position of the roots. Then we visualize where we have there the, the muckle gingival junction, and we start putting the mini implants. I always use 1.5 diameter by 8 millimeters long implants in the anterior part. Sometimes, uh, it depends on, on the... It depends on the brand of the mini implants. Uh, when I use the Ormco brand, they, they have a 1.4 diameter mini implant. That's also a very good uh, size for using on the, on the anterior part. These mini implants are from BioRay. They have a 1.5 diameter mini implant there. Now you can see how it's easy. It's very fast. And I use the big mirror so I can visualize it. First, obviously, I took an x-ray prior to that. And I always take x-rays at the, at the end of the insertion. But I like to put these videos uh, to my students or, or when I do a lecture. So you can see how easy it is. It's very, it's very fast. 
you take more time putting the anesthesia to the patient that what we take this is the the, the biray uh, mini implant you can see it's 1.5 by 8 millimeters long and this is where we when we put them you can see that i missed the, they're not at the same um altitude so I, that was a, an error for mine but we what we're doing here we're going to put very slight forces so we start correcting the overbite now as the treatment progresses you're going to start seeing that i'm that i that i created an overbite an open bite i always measure the distance so i can be evaluating the the treatment here you can see how we're going to intrude so we need to do that because on the lower part, we already have, we practically close the spaces, but we still have spaces on the upper part and we didn't, we couldn't close it because of the overbite. So I, I wanted to correct the overbite so we can close the spaces and also to correct the gummy smile. Okay, this is more in the treatment advance. We can see now how we're opening the bite. We're gonna have uh, some protrusion of the incisors we're using some class two elastics to help us with the correction of the overbite with the space closure. And you can see when, once we start correcting the overbite, we're going to have uh, the, some of the spaces are going to start opening. Now that's something that, that we expect. So we're going to have better spaces so we can uh, uh, close the spaces and have a better relationship at the end. Now he, we're going to measure here how, how the mini implants, uh, the, how they are. And you can see here we have a, we've created a very big overbite, open bite. Sorry, They're, the mini implants are very close now to the arch wire. And this is a picture at the beginning. There were we had ten millimeters of distance between the the mini screw and the arch, and at the end we have five point five. But the majority of that of that uh, intrusion was all, is, is also inclination of the incisors. You're going to see another picture. This is the left side. It was at 12.5 at the beginning. And here we have seven millimeters. It was practically five millimeters from the beginning to the end. Now you can, you can see how the crown uh, size, it's, it's shorter because of the gingival tissue. At the, at the moment that we start intruding the teeth, we're gonna also have an overlap of the gingival uh, tissue. So we're gonna need to do some gingivectomy at the end. But uh, this can, helps us a lot to correct uh, the intrusion on the interior parts for the gummy smile. Now, in this case, we changed the mini implants. We took them off. We sterilized them. We put them in between the roots of the six and the, uh, of the molars and the second bicuspid. So this helps us to close the spaces. You can see here how big open bite we have. Uh, don't get worried. You're going to see at the end, it closes all. And this is a few months later. Now we've closed the spaces. And we have a correct overbite and overjet there. Now, you, if you look at the in, in incisor position, uh, we we on purpose created that open bite and protrusion. So we when we close the space, it it it, it finished in the correct position. We have a proper inclination there. We're finishing to close the spaces, but we can see the the that we corrected the uh, the gummy smile. And the, the was, this was, very, uh, this was very, very good for the patient because when she left, she, she showed a lot of tissue. And in this case, uh, I don't know if she, prior to the first treatment, had the gummy smile or because of, the, of not controlling the, the torque in the incisors uh, uh, with the treatment, we, pro, we, we did that uh, excessive gummy smile. Now you can see the beginning at the end. And the important thing here is to control the incisor inclination. Okay. And you can see the beginning of the treatment and the progression and how it looks at the end. So this is the day we took the brackets off. We have some um, tissue inflammation there at the extraction sites, but we have a correct overjet. We have a correct overbite. And we have all of our spaces closed. So in this case, this was a, a patient that I, I finished about two years, two or three years ago. So uh, we did some gingivectomy. We still didn't do it with the laser, but it, it, it's like, uh, this is with the um, electrical um, uh, instrument. We removed the excessive tissue that we had there. So we have a better result at the end.
Now you can see at the end that she doesn't have a, a gummy smile. She has a better inclination of the incisors. And this is a, a very common situation that we can use in our office to correct that overbite. Now, this is a, a like, we can see what happened here. She had the extractions that were close in the spaces at, at the level of the arches. And we have, a, a, you know, an overbite. So what we did, we put the mini implants so we could intrude and procline the incisors. And in this case, it's very important for us to use a, a reverse speed curve arch in the lower in the jaw. So we can, we can also correct that overbite on the lower. You, you can put mini implants in the lower um, arch also, but it's, it, we have more reduced space between the roots. So I prefer to use like a reverse curve speed uh, arches in the lower so we can correct the overbite. And we uh, corrected the inclination and we, we, so you can close better the spaces. That's, that's a, an easy way. Now, um, we were seeing here some uh, intraradicular space closure. What we're gonna see now is some uh, infrasigmatic um, mini screws. And um, this is a, an article from Dr. Liu from Taiwan. And in this case, and, or in this article, they, they, they wanted to measure what's the correct angulation or the correct uh, position when we're doing an infrasigmatic uh, crest mini screw, where we go, where we're going to have the best bone thickness there. So uh, in this article, they they measured different insertion sites, and they were using five uh, degrees apart angulations, and they and they measure they're going to measure where we're going to have the best bone or the most thick. Uh, cortical bone there. So it, at, at the results they had, it was between 40 and, and it, it's going to be between 50, uh, 55 and 70 degrees angulation. It's going, to where, it's, going to where, it's going to be the position where we're going to have the best bone for the mini screw insertion. Okay. You can see here the results are in between 55 and 70 degrees angulation. And it's going to be uh, like 14 to 16 millimeters from the occlusal plane, that's going to be the, the, the best suitable site for the insertion of the mini screw when we're using infrasigmatic mini screws. Okay, you can use, you can see here, that's, that, that's why a lot of the authors or the lecturers uh, that we see a lot of doctors, they, they recommend a 60, angulation, a 60 degree angulation from the occlusal plane, that's going to be in the insertion site. Now it's going to be a correct place because first of all what we don't want is to 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 go to the to the sinus to the maxillary sinus and we don't we don't want to touch the roots of the molars okay i'm going to show you this case it's, it's a simple oh, now what uh, this is a i, I recommend I, I recommend you this journal from dr chris chang this is the the international journal of orthodontics and and implantology and this was uh, issue 47. Right now, this, this, this journal is called the JDO, Journal of Digital Orthodontics. You know, Dr. Strans Dr. Chang is a very, uh, he's a very, I, I admire him very much. He's a very progressive orthodontist and he shares all his information. This is free, you can download it from the site. And he's working a lot with digital orthodontics right now. That's why they changed the name of the journal. But in this issue, they're, they're talking about the correct site for the infrasigmatic crest uh, mini screws. And they're talking that the best insertion size is going to be distal of six and, uh, and seven of, of, the, of the upper maxillary arch. Because you can see here between the six and the, the first and the second molar, uh, that's the correct sites or the insertion. Now, it, it, it depends on the patient. You need to touch the patient uh, with, obviously with the gloves to see where they have the infrasigmatic crest. And that's still gonna be the best insertion site for this mini implant. Okay. So you can, so you can use this outside of the roots because when we put them uh, between the roots, it, we're gonna, it's gonna be a smaller size uh, mini screw. We're gonna have more a failure of the positioning. And when we you put in them outside of the roots, it's gonna be easier to do anterior posterior um, retractions okay that's the new concept that he uses and this is the book that i was uh, recommending for you this is uh, from dr john ling and it's a it's an excellent book that you can you can use 
you know, to do the references about uh, infra, uh, you know, uh, the screws that you can use extra availability. It has a lot of uh, also information about the Damon system and mini screws. Now we're going to see a, a case from uh, that we put an infrasigmatic crest. Now, uh, what we're trying to do here is to put it outside of the roots. Now I'm going to show you a little bit how this is done. In, in the beginning, when we put a mini implant in the infrasigmatic crest, at the, the first of all, what we're going to do, we're going to put the, the instrument. This is not going to be angled. We're going to be angled in 80 degrees from the, from the, from the molar. Okay. Now, when we start, we start inserting the, the mini screw exactly at the muckle gingival junction. You can see there, it looks like different pink color there. Once you cross the, the cortical bone, you're going to, as, as you start in, uh, moving your instrument, you're going to start, you know, changing the direction. And what we're going to do, we're going to try to look between 60 and 70 degrees. We're going to angulate that. So it goes exactly uh, when, where we have the best um, bone there or, or thickness of the bone. When you see it, the first time you do it, it looks very uh, like unreal, you know, like how you're going to, you know, bend the instrument inside of the, of the patient's mouth. But what we're doing, we're just bending it in the cortical bone. You, you must understand that we have a more uh, trabeculous or more, um, um, we only have, we're just going to bend it at the cortical bone. So we're, so we're going to have a better uh, stability of the mini implant. And, and, and because of that, we're going to have less failures. Okay. Now, this is a case that of uh, a patient of mine. Uh, this we're going to, we're using here some um, self ligating brackets. It's the insignia from Ormco. So, at the planning, what we wanted to do, we wanted to correct this over excessive overjet that our patient had. Okay. Now, uh, in this case, she had, um, uh, she, she had a very, uh, very light or very uh, thin periodontal tissue in the lower segment. So what we're going to try to do is to dislice on the upper segment so we can correct the class two. Uh, the benefit of using this system is that we, we can, um, you know, the, the bracket positioning and the torque compensation that we do on our cases. I don't do this in all of my cases, but it's a very good planning to do. Now, this is the patient at the beginning. And this is uh, when we put the brackets on, you can see that they're self ligating. And with this, and in this case, uh, we put this, this mini screw in the muckle gingival jun juncture, you can see that. And we're using a power chain, a very soft force, two ounces to the first bicuspid. Okay, so we can start doing the retraction. She also used some class two elastics that helped us to, with this uh, correction. Now, uh, in this case, our patient had a very small, uh, in, in the past lecture, we were talking about a smile design, and I was telling you that it's very important to understand that a lot of our patients are gonna have very small lateral incisors. So uh, in a lot of the times, like in this case, our patient had a prior treat ortho treatment, so they closed all the spaces and they left her in the class two canine position. So what we did here was we, we started to distalize the canines and uh, from just from the canine, so we can have a class one um, occlusion. So uh, we left the space at the end, so she can have the corrected. She can have the uh, some veneers placed there, and she had a better result. Now, as you see, they are very simple mechanics, and once we understand the correct size of the teeth, we can put them in a better position. Okay, I'm gonna show you here another case. This is a, uh, we have a, a previous treatment. She's also a patient that, that had a four bicuspid extraction that she didn't need. Now you can see what's, this is a, the, how she came to the office. You can see that it, it doesn't matter the type of brackets that you're using. Uh, I also, as you see, I also use uh, normal uh, conventional ligated brackets. Um, the problem is if you don't do a correct uh, space closure now, I, I, I imagine myself that also in India, you have that problem that a lot of uh, colleagues or dentists uh, don't have a proper um, ortho formation and they start putting brackets because it looks easy. Now, they, they, what they do, they just 
start putting some round wires and some power chains to close the spaces. Now you can see how the, the inclination of the canines there. Now, this is what happens. This is the, the effect that when you have a, you start overcorrecting an overbite. So you start opening the bite on the buccal side. Um, Dr. McLaughlin, Bennett, Trevesi described this in the, like a roller coaster effect in their book of the MBT. So when, you, when we don't have a correct uh, angulation of our incisors, this is what happens. Now the patient was uh, concerned because she started to, to see that her canines were going on a crossbite and, and she started feeling the roots on the buckle. Okay, you can see the arch form, it's very triangular. And obviously, well, this is not a good treatment. So we took the brackets off. We, we, what I always do, take the brackets off, we wait about a month. So it, they always have some relapse and we put some brackets, high torque brackets, so we can, we can help us or, or help us with the space closure. And we started leveling and aligning to correct at the beginning. I'm gonna go a little bit fast because you can see this effect on the side. So this, as you see, a lot of the, sometimes I don't do a lot of extractions. Uh, I do them what we need them, like in the case of the girl. But uh, I ha also have a lot of, of patients that had already some previous treatment that had the, the four by cuspid extractions, like these two cases that I'm showing you. So in this case is, is where we um, use mini implants. Now, in this case, we, we, we can see here, we have a better lining. Okay, we start correcting the, the lateral bite and the arch form. So we start closing the spaces and we also start seeing that she's gonna have a lot of, uh, uh, she still has uh, an excessive overbite and she also has, has a little bit of a gummy smile. So we decided to put, you can see here we're, we're closing in stainless steel wires. We did some bracket repositioning, but we still have some spaces there. You can see the overbite, even though we're using high torque brackets there, we're still finishing to close the space on the upper. Now in this case, uh, a lot of the cases where we're closing spaces and we have if we close the lower arch and still you have space on the upper arch, it could be a Bolton uh, discrepancy that we have there, tooth size discrepancy, or that's this excessive overbite, like in this case. So we put some tats, 1.5 by eight millimeters in the, in the anterior segment. Um, we put them between the central and the lateral incisors. What, what I wanted here was a little bit of intrusion so we can close spaces. Now you can see uh, that we're using very little force and we have, a, 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 we have it with a metal ligature on the four incisors so they don't open the space. And what we're gonna do here, we're gonna correct the anterior position. So you can see that I use this very often. You can see that we have this, um, it's very important to take an X-ray. And we saw here, you, know, you can see the resorption on the lateral incisor even though we're using self ligating brackets. So that happens in any kind of uh, treatment. So this is a little bit more in the treatment. So we're correcting the overjet, the overbite. We open a little bit more of the bite here, but we're gonna, we're, we're uh, working on this so we can start closing the spaces. We still have a little spaces there in the upper. And we always measure to see the difference between the sides. Now, this is September. I took this picture uh, when she came in the office. So you can see that the chains, they look a little bit yellow because I was gonna, I was gonna take the, the mini implants off because you can see the one on the, on the left for the patient, that, that was a little bit lower. It was beginning to, to loosen. It was beginning to, to have a lot of mobility. So we took the, we took the, the mini screws off that, that uh, appointment. We, are, we already corrected, we have an open bite in the front, you can see it, but we have a proper incisor inclination. Okay, we still have some little spaces, but we have, uh, you can see the correction. We took out the, the tads, and you, you can see the difference between, it was about three millimeters difference between from the beginning to the, to the day we took off the, the mini implants. 
The one on the left moved a little bit, so that's why I think it's a little bit more of the movement there. But here we can see the progression, how we had the overbite at the beginning and how we've been correcting it. You know, we're changing the position of the brackets and the use of mini implants. You can see here on the overbite pictures. You can also do this with, with, with a utility arch or intrusion rickets arch, but for me, it's easier to do this with mini implants. And here's some progression. I'm gonna just go fast here. Sometimes, usually this lecture is about three or four hours long, but we're gonna to try to do this a little bit faster. You can see it. Now we took the brackets off, this was last year. And you can see that, that we have a better incisor uh, position there. Um, we suggested the patient to have some um, um, composite restorations on the laterals. She didn't want any of the treatment, but we, we did we, we did with this patient was some gingival dual contouring. And this, we already had the, the laser. And you can see how clean, how easy it is to take that excessive gingival tissue that we have. And that helps us so we can have a more uh, aesthetic smile. This is the same day, you know, it's very easy. You, you need to put some anesthesia. And well, you can see here this little video, uh, this is with a laser. So you just, you're like, you know, like erasing the, or, or just uh, the gingival tissue and it's very easy. Obviously first we do a correct uh, analysis. We, we, we use our probe, we, we measure, because a lot of times when we're doing, you know, like in the premolar area, we have um, uh, um, hyperplasia of the tissue there. So that's where we can cut it off. But in the anterior, because we did a little bit of intrusion, we have a little bit of overlaps to the tissue. That's, we probe it, so we see how deep it is. And that's when we do the gingival uh, recontouring there, okay? Now this is from the beginning, you can see the final. And this is a month later. You can see how it, 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 it's, um, it, it's all you know, corrected, the, no, no inflammation. You can see the tissue looks very good a month later. This is the beginning and this is how it looks now. So we, it's a lot of, it does a great difference to, to, the, to do this gingival recontouring because our patients are more satisfied with the treatment. You can see here, that's the initial just after the, the recontouring, two weeks later and a month later, it's, it's, already, uh, it's already recovered, the tissue. Okay, this is a picture of my city. Al, I, I, I'm gonna put, this is a picture that I took in a, a demo forum in, in Orlando with Dr. Chang. I, I'm a huge fan of him. I've learned a lot from his lectures and from his journal. That's why I recommend you a lot, uh, his journal. And uh, this is uh, what I'm going to show you here are some cases where we do we use this lever arm to um, to re to track to 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 erupt you know to help the, for the eruption of the canines. And this is some cases where we have some impacted canines, and I saw this first from Dr. Chris Chang. Now this is a patient. She's around 12 years old. She's in mixed dentition. And she was referred from a colleague. Now you can see here, she still has some, some uh, temporary teeth, but you, the first thing that I saw was the inclination of the lateral incisor and she didn't. So I send this patient to have some CB, to do a CBCT. You can see this. She had an inclination, she had very large teeth, very beautiful teeth. But we can see there that she's still on, on the mixed dentition, but her canines were not erupting in a correct position. So uh, you can see a lot of incisor. You can see how, how procline it is. Now we, we, we obviously do a CBCT. I rec strongly recommend you to do this in every uh, case where we have impacted canines, because you can see here how our canine was on the root of the lateral incisor. That's why we had our lateral incisor very uh, with that inclination. Okay, that's the right side. And on the left side, it was more at, at the, by the root of the central incisor. Okay, now, the, it, well, we can talk all day about the benefits of the CBCT, but the, the greatest benefit is that we can see where it is. You know, when I started practicing ortho around 20 years ago, 
we only use our x-ray, the panoramic, the occlusal x-ray and, and uh, lateral CEF. And you had to imagine the position. Now with the CBCT, we can see exactly where it is. And what, we tr what, what, what we're gonna try to do here is to move the canine without putting brackets on the rest of the teeth. Uh, usually, or the, the, the way we used to do it was we put the brackets on, we started to open the space for the canine. And once we had the space, we send our patient to the, to the surgeon. So they did the, uh, the, the bracket position on the canine and we started to traction the, the, the teeth. Now, uh, the problem was that when we put the bracket on the lateral incisor, that lateral incisor started to, uh, the root is gonna touch the canine and that's what prevented the, the movement of the canine in these cases. So what we're doing here, I'm gonna move a little bit fast. You can see the, the CBCT, what the position of the canine was with the lateral incisor. That's why it was very proclined, but we can see that it wasn't affecting the root. Now on the other side, this is the, the canine with the central incisor, it was starting to, provo to, to do some resorption of the, the, of the root. So it was very important to start doing the treatment here. Now, this is two years ago. Uh, this is the uh, picture of the flap. So the, the most important thing here is to take a lot of bone out of there. And uh, this is what um, Dr. Chang shows us with a, with a burr, we're starting to take off all of the bone around the crown of the teeth. You can see there. We have to take the, the bone, you know, and, and you have to take all the cortical bone it, towards the, the eruption site. So the teeth, we, we, what we're doing here, we're, we're doing a, a, a wrap a phenomenon. You know, we're, we're provoking some wrap there. That's a rapid acceleration phenomenon. So it, it more inflammation there. So we have a lot of, a, of a movement there. So this is the mini implants. They're two by 12. And this is a month later, you can see how we have the two mini implants and we have this level arm. This lever arm is done with a 19 by 25 stainless steel wire. And the objective of here is to, we, now we're, gonna, we're using some power chains. Now, uh, in this case, we're using a memory chain from American Orthodontics. It's a second generation chain because a normal uh, power chain, it doesn't last, the elasticity is it's a very short uses. Now it's very important for you to use a second generation power chain and because this, we're gonna use them about three or four months. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna start, we're gonna change the, the, the lace of the chain. We're gonna start chain, we're gonna, you know, like uh, start to activate that. Or what we're gonna do, we're gonna bend the power arm. So it starts to activate. And if you use, if you see this passive, it's gonna be on the outside and towards the buckle and the low uh, and, and the occlusal. You can see on the both sides. Now they, they both behave very differently because of the position. The one on the right side erupted more easily and the one on the left side that was at the apex of the central incisor was a, bit, was a little bit more difficult to, to retract. Okay. These are the pictures. And you can see that the incisor there. Okay, now this is, you can see this is the one on the right. We can see the canine. So in, in when we did the, the this is like, 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 this is what it looked like at the beginning. And you can see, this is the level arm. It's 19 by 25 still steel wire. We put it at two by 12, and we're gonna start the retraction of the canine. You can see this is three months later. We can, we can see now the, the power chain, it's, it's starting to, to show. And this is six months later, we already have our canine out in the mouth. Now, this is the, this, the right side was very easy because it was, it was at the height, it was in the, in, the, in the root of the lateral incisor, but the one on the right was a little bit more difficult to, to move. I'm gonna show you. Now, this is some months later, you can see that our canine is in a better position there. And you can see that this is the x-rays. I always take x-rays. It's very important to do this because you see if, you're, if the teeth is moving or not, okay? Now this is one on the one on the right. You can see that way up higher around the, the, the apex of the central incisor. So we did the same. This is two months, a picture. 
but it didn't erupt. And obviously the chain tore off. So what we decided to do here was to open the space first. So we put the brackets on, we started opening the space. This is 15 months later. And here we have the, the x-ray, it moved very little at the beginning. So what we needed to do was to change the, the vector of the, of, the, of the retraction. So 17 months later, well, around a year later, we did another, we opened another flap, we put, in, we put another chain there, but this time we didn't use a power arm. We put it directly to, this is an, an 0 0.018 stainless steel wire with a helix there. So we, we put this power chain to the helix. So we were, we, we, what we wanted to do was a more a distal vector of the retraction. So this is 17 months later from when we started the treatment. This is 19 months. We can see how the canine is starting to show there. Now it's very important to, 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 to uh, debond the lateral incisor because if we put, we leave the bracket there in the lateral incisor, that the roots is going to prevent the can the canine from erupting. So you, you're going to see how, as the canine starts to move, it's going to push the lateral incisor. Now this is uh, this was taken a week ago in May. This is 25 months uh, after we started the first treatment. We can see that the canine is now erupting, so we're going to use the this. We're using this open coil, so we can open a little bit more of the space. We're not uh, the lateral incisor. We still are not touching it. It's not. Um, it's not um, in the arch. We're going to open the space, but you can see we now we put in a conventional button there on the canine, so we can start distalizing there. I want to show you this, so you can see that. Sometimes not not always the treatment result is that has as as we expected. So we have to do different situations there. Okay, this is just a picture from the uh, uh, a week ago. I'll show you this last case. It's a very similar case. Now this patient was ten years old. Okay, can you You're hear me? You're all good, Jorge? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I think you, okay, need great. To, you need to share your screen again. Okay, sorry. Let me go again. Okay, there you go. Okay, can, can you see me there? Yes, yes. Okay, let, let me just put, put this, minimize. Okay, there it goes. Okay, so you can see the position of the incisors, how they're protruded because of the canines. So uh, look, this is the CBCT also from this patient. And you can see on this case, her, the, right, uh, the right canine was resorting the root of the central incisor. Now the canine on the left, if you look at the lateral incisor, we have a, a small crown size incisor there. It's like a peck uh, uh, crown shape. And the canine is between the roots of the central and the lateral incisor. You can see his on, on, the, on this lateral view. It, it, in, in, it looked easier, but it was, a very, it was a little bit more difficult to move that. Now, in this case, we did the same approach that we did on the previous patient, okay? We decided, now, no, well, no, sorry. On this case, we put the mini implants, but we, what we did was a lot where we, started to move it with a Vista. I, I learned this from Dr. Chang. This is a Vista kind of done flap. You can see the, okay. So we put, this is an eyelid that we put on the canine. This was done by a perio uh, doctor. And we use this, this is the eyelid. Now the, the, the reason why we're using this so we can put past the chain through the eyelid and you can you, know, you, you can um, you can you can you can hold it easier that with the button because with the with using a normal button it's easier for them to loosen off so we're going to put this is two by 12 uh, mini implants that we're going to position this now you can you, you can see the sequence of the pictures how we're going as we put the 
implant in the mouth of the patient, it starts to, we start to inclinate it. Okay, and there it goes. That's the one on lead to the canine. Now, what we're gonna do in every point, we, we, we're gonna cut the chain and we're gonna start to, to activate it. So the canine starts to move away from the, the, from, the, from the roots of the central and lateral incisor. Okay, that's the one on the right. And we did the same on the left. You can see how we're, we're gonna move the instrument as we insert it there. I'm gonna go a little bit fast here. This is the memory chain from American. There's different brands. Uh, you can use any brand you want. The important thing is to use a second generation chain, okay? Now, this is an advanced CBCT. Now we can see that the canines move, okay? The one on the right moved very easily and it's in the, in the position that we want now. Now, the one on the left at the beginning, it didn't move. So we, you can see there that we put the power, we changed the, the, the approach that we were doing. So we, we took off the chain that we had put under the flap and we did this power arm like, you saw, like we saw in the previous treatment. And we started to pull the canine to the buckle. So it, it erupted. We can see the, the mini implants in the CBCT. And this is the one on the left side. You can see it that how it moved the lateral incisor. So we're gonna have to do a lot of work there with our ortho treatment. You can see how the roots are inverted there, but our canine was in the mouth. That was the important thing. You can see the canine there. They're already out. So once we have this situation, well, our treatment's gonna be much more easier, okay? Now you can see we need to be very careful with the roots of the incisors because of the resorption that it had and with the root of the lateral incisor because it's a very small and, and thin root. But we can see this from the advance when we started. So when we started correcting the canines, this is the panoramic x-ray. You can see that they're in the correct position there. This is the, the initial and the advance x-ray. Now, this is the, the lateral ceph on the beginning. Now, look at the position of the incisors on this one. They, once we took off the canines from the roots of the incisors, the, the force of the lip put the incisors in a better position. Now, with this, we could see that we have, uh, we could understand, I always tell my, my students that we, we, you, you must believe in, functional forces there with the lip. Now, once we took off the canines, the lip properly positioned our incisors in the correct position there. You can see the advancements, how they move, how it moved. Okay, now this is, this is what uh, we're doing here with some self-ligating brackets from 3M. This is a Gemini self-ligating bracket. And we're gonna start to, to, to put the canine in the correct position. This is a situation that we have, okay? Now, this is a few months into the treatment. We already got our canines. We're gonna start to, to put them in the correct position. You can see the small crowns of the lateral incisors. And well, from this point on, it's, it's just a simple case. We need to use very light forces. These are some advancement pictures. And you can see the inclination of the lateral incisor. So it's very important that we use very light forces so we could just finish this case. Obviously, this patient was 10 years old when she started. You can see there the, the gingival tissue. And this is July from two years ago. We took, this is the day we took the brackets off. You can see the, the, the canines are now in the correct position. We have a very small lateral incisors. I, I recommended the patient to do uh, gingival recontouring, but I send it to the specialist, to the perio specialist, because of the of the nature of the case, because she had um, the root resorption. So I didn't do this myself. I I I referred it to to the doctor, and I I referred her also for some aesthetic treatment of the lateral incisors, but she hasn't done that. She went with the periodontist. 
and we're going to show you the pictures that she sent me. But we can see that it's a fairly uh, well case. We have our, our canines great position. We, we have our lateral incisors there. We have a good occlusion. We, we, I'm using here some fixed uh, retention on the upper incisors and on the, on the lower three by three to three. I also used a, a regular um, removal retainer on the, on the upper. But in this case, when, when we have some resorption of the central incisors, well, we put some fixed retention there. I obviously I tell the parents that she needs to be in, and uh, we need to see her uh, very. Con she needs to go to her dentist to take some X-rays because of the resorption of the incisors. But you can see that they didn't change color. Now we have here the progression of the treatment. How we um, put we finish the case on the upper, and you can see the frontal view. How we move the canine. How we put it in the position, and at the end. You can see the arch form and the finish of the treatment, how we finish the treatment. Now, um, this is the pictures that uh, the, the specialist sent me. And you can see how it looks much, much better. I've tried to call the patient to come back to the office so I can take some final pictures. She hasn't come. And uh, well, that's, that's, but you can see it's a fairly good result once the, the, you know, the, the recontouring, because in this case, they had to remove some bone. And well, just to finish this, I would like to finish with this um, quote from Albert Einstein. And well, it, it's here it's 8.55 in the morning. And I want to thank Dr. AJ and all of you for your, for your, for your attention. And I don't know if we have some time for some questions here, but- uh, uh, Yes, uh, uh, we have already <laughs> answered around 25 questions. I, I did. Uh, 25 questions, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kept few of the questions open, which was relevant, which are relevant to you. Okay. Uh, rest of the general question I answered. The first question is, which type of cutting threads would you like to use? Which type of what? Thread, thread design, the thread. Oh, uh, the thread design. I, I, um, the self, uh, self perforating. I don't know if that's the self taping. The, 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 uh, yeah, self, self taping. Yeah, yes, because in, in, uh, if we see some, some reviews, some articles, the ones that were first used a lot, some years ago, you had to use a little drill and that overheated the bone. So I, I use self-tapered uh, mini implants, yes. Right. Then there's a question uh, from Dr. Kusum Agarwal. When is the hook placed in the occlusal direction instead of a pike? Was there any oh. specific condition? No, that? that was because I was using, uh, in one of the cases, that the, I was using the, the, the arch wire, you know, on, with, the, with the hooks to, to the gingival. And when I put the mini implants, the only thing I did was just turn around the arch and put it to the lower. It didn't have a specific uh, use. But as you saw, the, uh, uh, as the treatment progressed in that patient, the hook was gonna touch the implant. That's why I turned it around. Usually I, always, I, I also put it you know, around the wire so I don't even use a hook. But in that case, I already had the hook there. So that's why I put it on, I, I put it on to the lower. Okay. It's just a, a, it's another alternative that you can use. Okay. There's but, a question from Dr. Pooja Kanna. Okay. In the cases treated earlier, how much relapse have you seen in the end mass distalization and intrusion that has been achieved with the help of TADs? And how do you retain the intrusion that has been achieved with TADs? So what is your protocol for uh, retention? As you have already mentioned that you would wish to see them very often. And what about the distillization which you achieved and mass distillization? So uh, any relapse uh, been anticipated? Okay, the, the most important, uh, you can, you can in, in every treatment, you can have some relapse, but the important thing, uh, it, 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 that's why I always try to li, li, uh, don't leave an overbite because if you leave a patient with an overbite and, and, and excessive overbite, it's more common to have some relapse, okay? Some, some space opening. So I always try to leave the less overbite I can and I, I always use, I always tell the patient to use, uh, uh, we use a, a, a howling or wraparound 
on the upper and the lower in extraction cases, even though sometimes I put uh, some came from, from three to three fixed uh, retainer. But in those cases, I always try to use the wraparound um, because can if we, I use it can like we, an Can Essex, we do something like uh, IZs is already there. So can we give a kind of uh, Essex retainer with the uh, hooks on the canine region and give a little bit of elastic there? With the retainer, yeah, you, you, I, I've never, I never tried that, but I, I think we can use that also, yes. Not, you know, with it, a, not with like not with the heavy forces, with the very light maintaining force. Yes, yes, you need to use, uh, when, when we use that, we use very, very, very light forces. But um, I, re I really strongly recommend always the patients to be very, you know, very, very, uh, very, com uh, very compliance with the, with the retainers because if you don't use them, they're going to start opening the space. Uh, in like any treatment. In, in in your your view, uh, how how much uh, distillation is more stable? Like two mm, three mm, four mm. What is your take on that? Well, uh, in in uh, what, what do you mean? I didn't understand the question. The maxillary distillation. Uh, okay. Yes. Right. So. In your view, what is more stable if you like, uh, if I may not be, see uh, myself, I'm not comfortable doing anything more than three mm on each side. Yes. Right? Because yes, I'm a little scared that it might come ahead and, and because of the anatomy is such that I'll not be able to go more distally. So uh, uh, what is your take on it? Oh, yes. I, I, I when I do, I, I try. I, if you see in, in, the, in the first case that I did the extractions on the upper, it, it was already like class two, the molars. So what I wanted to do just was to prevent, you know, I always try to do mass retraction because uh, the half and half on the, on the front side and the, and the back. And uh, I put the mini implants just to, to be more sure that I did, I'm not losing anchorage on the, on the molar because it was already class two. That's why I use the mini implant, but I, I, I agree with you only about three millimeters. I don't try to do a lot of it because it, it's not stable. It's not going to work. And on the other cases that were uh, four by cuspid extraction that had previous treatment, I tried to do in mass retraction. Okay. What I, what I, what I use the mini implants was for the intrusion. Now, in one of the cases I put, she had on the, on the front, then I put the same on the back was just to help me to do the, the closure of the space. But we were doing, I, I like to do in mass retraction because I believe it's more stable. Because okay. if, we, if we try to do a, a complete distillation, it's very, very, it's not that, that stable. Okay, uh, there's a question about second generation power chain. How, like how, like how, how, how it uh, differs from the first generation? Uh, the, the 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 difference uh, basically is that the, the 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 second generation chains have a lot have more longer time of elasticity. You know, it, it the the normal power chain you you can it lasts about a month with activated in the mouth. But the the second generation chains you can you can it has it's going to be elastic of around four or five months it, if you put them like for a canine retraction. At the beginning, the first time I saw it, I didn't believe it. You know, I, I said, I'm not, I don't believe that's going to happen. But when I started to use that, I, I, I realized that it, would, it, would, it was easier. And you just had to, you know, change the, the, the loops, you know, to activate the, the, the you know, the lavones, we call them, the, the you just activate the, the, yeah, the slots, you only activate it, and that, that was easy to do that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mitali Sharma is asking, so with the lever arm that was used to bring canines occlusally, yes. would the molars be intruded by reciprocal force? No, because I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, I was anchored only on the mini implant. If you use that, I, I tried once to do that with, with a transpalatal arch to, to directly to, a, to the band of the molar. And what happened was that my teeth, the molar moved. It, so that's why it's recommended to use a mini implant skeletal anchorage because you're outside of the root and you're only doing the movement of the canine to the, to the buckle. It's easy right. like that. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Pooja Kanna. Mm -hmm. Why do you prefer to bring the canines first in mouth and then bone rest of the teeth? 
because if we if you bond if you bond the brackets at the beginning and uh, what, what, what could happen is that if, for example, if you have the lateral, the canine and the lateral incisor, once you put the bracket on the incisor, it's gonna to touch the canine. And then your vector is gonna to be to this, you know, to this side. Now, if you don't put the brackets on, you leave the, the incisors in like a in, uh, free body. And as you move the canine, it, it's gonna push the other teeth. You can see there how it pushes the teeth and it's more easier to, to erupt. One of the mistakes that I had in that I did used to do was th that I did that I put the brackets on, then I started to to move the canine, and commonly we we traction the canine to the arch wire, and it's sometimes it it touched the the, the root of the other teeth and it got resorbed. Now that I prefer to move it buccally outside of the roots first, and then I bond the bracket. It's more easier to to bring them back. Okay, uh, there's a question from Dr. Raghu. How much was the total duration of canine traction into the arch uh, in the last patient presented? And in, in the last, it was around, um, to, to get them to the arch, it was about eight months. The total treatment time was a little over two years of treatment okay. with the patient. Yes, it, it, they're, they're not fast treatments, you, but uh, for example, you could, you could bring in out to the mouth it's, it's an ideal time six to eight months good but yeah. you need to be you, you need to be taking uh, x-rays because in some cases when i'm tractioning canines by the fourth month if i don't see that it's moving i try to change my 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 approach to the treatment okay you have flooded with a lot of good uh, messages also thanks well, doctor thank for you. the fantastic presentation uh, a lot of people are complimenting you, uh, thank you i'll take much. the last question should the length of liver arm be reduced as canine reaches occlusion? Uh, sorry, what's the question? Is, like, is would you would you would you be reducing the length of the uh, liver? Oh arm? yes, some yes. Sometimes you reduce the length of the of the of the of the level arm. You can you can uh, reduce it. And an important thing, sometimes when you're activating the chain, if the chain doesn't have any any, you can't do any more activations. What you can do, you take a, a three, a, um, a three piler, you know, a okay. three three peak. How you call it? Say? Three, uh, yeah, three prong, three prong plier. Three, three prong plier, and just bend it, and you have an activation of the of the lever arm. And uh, most of the times, you don't shorten the, the distance. You measure it, the lever arm from the minimum implant to the canine zone, and that's just good enough. Okay, we have somebody raising their hand, Dr. Mina. Kamel. Dr. Mina, please. Yes, uh, good evening, Dr. Uh, Joshi Garcia. Thank you so much for your amazing and outstanding presentation, as well as for Dr. Okay. Ajay. Uh, Dr. Uh, George Garcia, can you please return to the slide of, for the center of resistance of the maxilla and mandible for the implant placement, please? Oh, yes, of course. And Dr. Rakesh Kohl is asking that, have you used that the TAD is in degenerative dentition, severe bone loss, parental breakdown cases in adults anytime? If I use what? Except, uh, have you used TADs in uh, degenerative dentition or severe bone loss or parental breakdown cases in adults? Yes, some, so, so, well, I, 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 sometimes I use them as a, uh, uh, to help us with the anchorage in, in when, when you don't have any teeth on, on the dentalist area. I, I, I sometimes I use them, yes, okay. also. Please go and ahead. in periodontal patients, you just need to, to see what's your objective in the treatment. Exactly. Because yes, because the center not, of it, resistance it, changes. Yes, the central resistance changes. Now, in, in this case, it's it's important to to understand the 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 direction or where you're going to put the force. Now it changes from patient to patient. It's not always the same. That's why it's very important to to be evaluating your treatment as you do the retraction or the movement. And approximately, it's it's at the middle of the roots where you have the uh, the, uh, the bicuspids is where you have the central rotation. And that's for the direction. Sometimes when we start closing spaces and you're you're more you know, like in this case that you're putting the, the cane, the power chain at the arch level, you get that, that negative effect. So you need to pass the force a little bit upper there. But all, okay. all, you, need, you need to use a, a stainless steel 19 by 25 wire. You, you should add some, some curve speed there when you do the, the space closure. It's very important to do that. Those arch compensations 
So you have the less undesired effects when you do the close, the space closure. Okay, okay and Dr. Dr. Mina? Yes, uh, excuse me, Dr. Georgie Garcia. Where's the ID placement for the placement? There was a slide before, not this slide, the one previous before it, please, if you can go to it. About idle placement, okay. okay. The idle placement, yes. For IZC, you mean to say, or for interradicular? Which one? The the one that uh, there was one uh, written in the maxilla and in the mandible. This one. Can you just go to this slide, please, Dr. Georgie Garcia? I think he is mentioning about uh, Dr. Johnny Jin's uh, one of the slides which you have seen, which you, you had shown yes. about the idle placement site for the maxilla. And yes, the... exactly. The, oh, okay, from, from this one, this one. No, no, not this one, the one before it. No, not this one, sir. The one that you were explaining for the center of resistance, not this one at all. It was the one before the previous slide that you just uh, displayed it. No, not this one, before it. Okay, I think I know which one it is. This one or what? Ah, yes, this one. Now I want to ask you a question, doctor. Now, if you have any anatomical variation, uh, concerning for the maxilla or the mandible, any atomical or any agenesis of any tooth, either the upper fives or lower fives or any. Does the center of resistance also changes concerning for the uh, retraction or the on-mass retraction that will occur? Uh, no, it, depend it depends on the situation. But uh, for example, it depends on, on, on your objective of treatment. You know, the, the thing here is that, uh, for example, imagine this case doesn't have a... a some the the you know the molars you don't have molars on the upper and you want to close yes. the space it's it's going to be uh, you you need to change I, I what i would do like put a power hook to put the hook on the upper more more gingival more higher so the force goes uh, more in, in a certain level you know like i place the power hook here to put the chain here so it, it, it it's a little bit more controlled if you don't have these teeth Obviously, yes. and it de it depends on the case because it it, it every case ca every case it's it's different. And that's why it's very important to use very very uh, soft and, and and gentle forces once you're moving your teeth. But uh, it 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 changes it it changes from every case. Now okay. I, I see a lot of colleagues from Brazil that they're using mini plates. They put mini plates, but they you need to, you know like a, a surgeon to put that. And they put mini plates on, on the buckle on, on the upper and the and lower. And you need a surgeon to remove it also. Yes, you need a surgery, but you, you can see some extraordinary results also from that. I don't use it because, uh, you know, what, what, what I try to do is do it a more simple or more practical approach with my patients. So it's easier and easier for me. But uh, you can also, you, you could do a lot of things with, with skeletal anchorage, you know. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you so much. That's okay. what I tell you. Uh, Thank you. Not all the time. I don't have a. Yes, yes. You're okay. welcome. Uh, there's a Dr. Anuradha Pandey has raised hand. Dr. Anuradha, please go ahead. Oh, very, uh, very good. Uh, good, after, good evening, sir. So, good myself evening. and Dr. Anuradha, Dr. Anuradha from Patna, Bihar. Sir, uh, it's just this slide only. I want to know that if we are having an extraction of premolar in upper and lower edge, only this slide only. So, it would be great so if you would be telling me that is that a center of resistance of uh, this maxilla and uh, uh, mandible will be changing or not? No, like, in, in the, oh, yes, uh, yes, I, I need, I, I didn't clarify this. In this case, uh, it's, it's re you, you can see the center resistance more in the apex of the roots, but it's, it's more when you do a uh, total arch distillation. Yes, when you have like when you want when you want we do, when you don't have extractions, you just put you know start doing some in mass retraction. That's approximately where it is. But when you have a four by cuspid or some extractions, the 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 situation changes a lot because in that case you you can use your anchorage like in if you put it in infrastigmatic or or a buccal shelf mini implant. You can use it as an indirect anchorage to the to the molars or premolars, and from then you do the, the retraction. You know, it, it depends if you're doing a direct anchorage or indirect anchorage situation, but it changes. This is when you when you do an emas, you know, complete distillation, and I don't recommend to do that um, you, only when you have like like a edge to edge molar relationship to do an, an a total retraction. Obviously, in those cases, you do extraction of the third molars first, and then you start doing that retraction. If you have a full class two, it's preferably to do extractions of, of bicuspid because it, 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 that is going to be, do a more shorter treatment time because it's going to be larger if you don't do that. 
Thank you so much, sir. You're Thank welcome. You so much. You're very welcome. Uh, we have with us a uh, few panelists here. Uh, because uh, Dr. Anup, thank you for uh, joining in as a panelist and thank you for answering a few of the questions as well. It's a pleasure having you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chandrasekhar, sir, for joining in and thank you, Dr. Prasad, for joining in. If you have anything to uh, share or anything to uh, have a word regarding Dr. Orge's presentation, please go ahead. It will be a pleasure. <coughs> Good evening, Dr. Orge. Good evening, Dr. Orge. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you about the Tizid Cis. That also you have clearly explained in the last few questions. Very wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. George Garcia. It's excellent you. presentation and uh, you've shown your cases which are very easy to comprehend. I'm sure all the participants have enjoyed and uh, gained uh, tips to try in their practice. And uh, thank you very much, Ajay, for taking care of all the people uh, continuously and uh, you're working so hard in getting so many speakers. I, I should thank you, my, uh, my better half who is allowing me to uh, be busy. <laughs> It's uh, all, all uh, thanks to my course. wife and my family who's supporting uh, me. Unless this without our cooperation, you cannot. <laughs> yes. And, uh, really, you're doing an excellent job, Ajay, and you keep it up. I'm yeah. sure uh, every day <laughs> you're not sparing us uh, every day. You have to come and see. <laughs> I'm, I'm grilling all of you. <laughs> intellectually. <laughs> no, no, it's wonderful. Uh, and, uh, starting from uh, one day, I'll see somebody from France, one day Mexico, one day Brazil, one day East, West. All over the world. Okay, uh, we thank have you. Dr. Thank Anu Belvedi also. Yeah, thank you, Ajay. Uh, it was wonderful, and thank you, George. It was wonderful. Thank you. I think the, uh, there's so much uh, can be discussed, but I think uh, uh, short of time and uh, so many good questions coming up, and uh, Ajay has answered and Dr. George has answered them so well. So looking forward to uh, more discussions in the future and uh, continuation of these uh, uh, same topic in future in uh, with more time and more uh, detail. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you, Dr. Jorge, for such a wonderful presentation. It's a great honor for me. Yeah, it's, it's always a pleasure talking to you as well as, you know, uh, listening to you and your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Sir. It's amazing. Thank you, Thank and you please much. stay safe, yeah. right? And it's time for you to have a breakfast as well. <laughs> Thanks. <Yes>. For... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. See you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.